Und hier finde ich auch noch die nächste Hitze. Sehr gut. Can you hear just fine, uh, Muhammad Yunus? All right, Habib. I got some notes. Just pass those out. Make sure the sisters get some. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam, mubarak. Al Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So, inshallah ta'ala, uh, tonight, we're going to take a look at the chapter uh, in which the Sheikh and the Imam he said, Babun min al Shirk, Lips al Khayt, Lips al Khalqati, Wal Khayti, Munahuhima, Giraf al Balai, O Defi. Babun. من الشرك لبس الحلقة والخيط ونحوهما يرفع البلاء أو دفعه. So he says chapter wearing a ring, twine, or something similar to relieve some affliction or repel it is an act of shirk. I want to give you لحظة شوي محمد أنا put it up on the whiteboard so you'll be able to see follow along with us as well. <clears throat> so as you see uh, from the bullets, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit about principles and the importance of those principles in Islam. Then we're going to talk about a specific principle related to um, the chapters that we're going to discuss. Then after that, we're going to dissect the principle that you see uh, written there or cited there. We're going to dissect it talk about its general meaning, the reasoning behind the principle, and substantiating evidence from the sunnah. What's the basis or what's the delil for the principle? And then finally, we we'll talk about causes being two types and the rules that govern causes. So we're probably going to deal with all this before we actually get to the actual chapter. Next week, we'll probably start the actual chapter. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the concept of principles. If you notice in Islam, you have, now obviously Islam is not just this, but a big part of it is Islam telling us, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us, his messenger telling us, this is halal, this is haram, this is iman, this is kufr, this is hypocrisy, this is tawheed, this is shirk. So we have a lot of us being told what things are and, and things being given labels. You guys, follow me. And then those labels are supported with what? Texts. So Allah tells us in the Quran something is halal or haram, something is um, shirk, something is kufr. Same thing in the Sunnah from the Prophet. So we have these textual proofs. But what they do is they just give us what? A specific ruling for a specific thing. Okay, a specific ruling for a specific thing. But when other things, when we come in contact or we confront other things, the only way for us to know their ruling is what? Is to look for the evidence that's applicable to that thing. You guys follow me? Does that make sense? 
so far? So basically, we have these rulings that come to us from Allah and the Quran, come to us from the Prophet and the Sunnah, where we're told, for example, X is shirk, X is kufr, X is whatever. The problem with that is, is that it's difficult to know all of what? All of the proofs. Know the entire Quran. Know the entire Sunnah. And if we use this method or rely purely on this method to know the rulings of things, we're going to miss things. You guys follow me? And when we miss things, we may end up doing things which are shirk, not realizing that they are shirk. Does that make sense? Okay? So what can help us in this? What can help us is that instead of relying solely on the delete, solely on a textual proof that gives us a ruling, is if we know what? The principles upon which these rulings are based. And if we know this, then that principle can be what? A gauge, a guide, a yardstick, a criteria by which we can say, hey, this thing is, is wrong, even though I don't have what? A textual proof to say it's wrong. I, don't, I can't say it's wrong because this ayah. It's wrong because this hadith, but no, it's wrong because what? The ayat and the hadith that are present that I'm aware of, what? They indicate what? This principle. Follow me so far? Does that make sense? So what this does for us is it gives us the reason behind the ruling. And if we have the reason behind the ruling, we can do what? We can make analogy and apply it to different situations without having to know the exact delil for every situation. That's why principles are so handy. Principles are so important in Islam. So for example, um, let me give you an example. We have the hadith, I'll give you an example, the hadith of Imran ibn Hussein, collected by Bukhari and Muslim, in which the Prophet said to Imran, he said, Salli qa'iman, he said, pray, stand, gives him a command. This is the original rule, the original state of prayer is that when you pray, you should stand. فَإِلَّمْ تَسْتَطِيَ فَقَائِدًا But if you can't stand, because what? Because you have a problem in your knees, problem in your back, because of some ailment. If you can't pray standing, then do what? Sit down. You can't sit up because of some ailment, some sickness, some weakness, some pain in your body. You could actually pray what? Lying down. Follow me? So we have this hadith, and the hadith tells us the ruling of a person who cannot stand due to some ailment or illness. Okay? That he could do what? He could pray seated, he could pray lying down. Okay, so it gives a specific ruling for a specific circumstance. You with me? Tayyip, suppose a person was on an airplane and there was no place to stand. And it was against their policy in terms of security to stand. And if he were to stand and try to pray and block the aisleway, he would be arrested and thrown in jail. Could he sit down and pray in that circumstance? Does the hadith say that? No, the hadith doesn't say that. But the hadith points to what? A principle in Islam. And that is what? Al-mashakkatu tajlibu at-taysir. That difficulty procures ease. Right? It also points to another, um, another principle. And that's the principle that... Um, Al-wajib yasqut mal adz. That something which is on normal circumstances obligatory becomes no longer becomes obligatory if you want, if you're unable to do it, regardless of the reason why you're unable. So this hadith gives us what? A principle that we can use what? In a circumstance which is different from the, from the hadith. And that shows you the usefulness of these what? These principles. Because you get in a situation which is not exactly like the hadith, but the hadith points to what? Points to a principle. Do you guys get the concept? Does the concept make sense? Perfect. So what we're going to do is, the Imam, he brings this chapter. The chapter, 
which he talks about how wearing a ring, twine, or something similar to relieve some affliction or repel it is an act of shirk. And the, the, this chapter and about 11 chapters that follow it, they all fall under, or they're all related to what? A principle. An important principle that if we know this principle, it will help us to understand why these things he's going to mention are shirk. But not only that, it's going to help us later on when we come into contact with other things that are not mentioned in the chapter, not mentioned in the hadith, and we can say, hey, that, that would be shit, that would be wrong. Why? Because we have what? We have the principle. Does that make sense? So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about this principle, the principle of what? Of al -asbab, the principle of causes. Okay? We're going to talk about that principle. And you have the principle right there. And the principle, it says, ظَنُّ الشَّيْءِ سَبَبًا وَلَمْ تَثْبُتْ سَبَبِيَتُهُ لَا بِالشَّرَعِ وَلَا بِالتَّجْرِبَةِ الظَّاهِرَةِ الْمُبَاشِرَةِ شِرْكٌ So basically what does that mean? To consider anything to be a cause for procuring benefit or repelling harm although its causative nature has not been confirmed neither by legitimate sources of legislation, a shah, nor by practical experience and or clinical tests is a form of shirk. Make sense? Any questions about that so far? Any questions about that so far? Obviously we're going to break this definition down and dissect it. But up till now, the concept of principles, so we talked in general about principles and how beneficial they are. And now we're going to talk about this specific principle and how it's going to be beneficial for us to understand what the shaykh intends from these chap the chapters that we're taking now and these cha the chapters that will come, the following chapters or the subsequent chapters. Any questions thus far? None? It's all clear? Boom, tats. Okay, so let's look at the the qa'idah, the principle, in, in a more detailed way, I guess. All right, so it says to consider anything to be a cause for procuring benefit or repelling harm. Okay? So basically, what does this mean? Understand, ya ikhwani wa khawati, that part of our belief in Allah's lordship, what is, when we say lordship, rububiyat Allah, we said that that goes back to what? That goes back to what? Allah's lordship goes back to what? It's related to what? Okay, Tawheed, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, but when we talk about the Lordship of Allah, we're talking about His, His actions. His actions. Things that He does that nobody else can do. Right? So part of our believing in His actions that only He can do is believing that fortune, whether it's apparent good fortune or apparent misfortune, is from Allah and from His will. He's the one who what? Creates it. He's the one who brings it into existence and wills it into existence. And it cannot be caused or prevented by any means except his will, right? Or a cause that he authorizes. Does that make sense? So when we say that something is a cause, and Allah didn't make it a cause, then what are we in fact saying? We're either saying that, look, this thing can do what Allah does. It can do what Allah does. Because Allah is the one who what? Who causes things or wills things to be causes. Or He does what? He authorizes something to be a cause. So if we say this thing is a cause, and Allah didn't say that, then we're in effect saying that this thing can do what Allah does. Right? It's a rival with Allah in the ability to what? To cause things. Or we're saying that or we're actually making something, we're competing with Allah in the quality of what? Making something a, a cause. Right? So that's the first thing. So when we make something a cause, we're procuring benefit or repelling harm. If we do that, then what? We run into what? A shirk in a rububiya. Okay, that's the first thing. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran? He says in Surah An-Nisa, verse 78, وَإِن تُسِبُهُمْ حَسْنَةٌ 
يقولوا هذه من عند الله وإن تسبهم سيئة يقولوا هذه من عندك قل كل من عند الله وما لهؤلاء ف... سوري فما لهؤلاء القوم لا يكادون يفقهون حديثا says and should they experience some good fortune they say this is from Allah and if they are afflicted by some misfortune they say this is your fault talking to the messenger sallallahu muhammad sallallahu say o muhammad all things good and bad are from Allah meaning his decree and his will so what is the matter with these people they hardly understand a word so the good and the bad the decree cause and effect comes from who Allah Allah alone this is his quality his ability his action and no one shares what this action with him so that's the first thing so if we believe if we were to believe that something can be a cause of fortune or a cause of misfortune independent of Allah then this would be shirk in tawheed lasma wa sifat la tawheed libada la tawheed arububiyya because this cause and effect making something a cause is something one which is from Allah's actions and it should because either the person considers something able to influence a person's fortune in spite of Allah. Allah likes it, he doesn't like it, this thing can what? Can make it happen. Right? And that's not possible. God fulfill them. question is, uh, what kind of shirk are you talking about here? Are you talking about the big shirk? The well, it's going to depend. When the Prophet said, in the Raqqawah and Tamaim, or two alat shirk, hadith. That shirk that you talk about and the hibad, the hibad that they used, uh, you know, you know the Arab used to have hey. for curing things, are those shirk that makes you kafir or that shirk hey. azhar? Taib, it could be akbar, and we're going to come to that. It could be akbar if he thinks that this thing can bring about fortune or repel, prevent misfortune, istiqlalan, independent of Allah, in spite of Allah. Whether Allah wills or doesn't will, this thing can make it happen, that will be shirk. Akbar. If the person believes that no, this it does it by Allah's will, it does it by Allah's will, then it will be shirk asghar. So shirk asghar that means he's Muslim, but he's Muslim, but he's committing an act of shirk that doesn't take him out of the fold of Islam. So like some people put the, you know, the blue eyes or the blue balls or stuff, they put them in their cars. They say this protects you from the eye. I mean, if they say that, is that like shirk akbar or asghar? طيب, you tell me, would it be shirk akbar or asghar? But they say Allah subhanahu Ah, but there you go. So Allah if they say if it's from Allah, shirk asghar. If they, they say, say no, this thing they does say it, it stops, stops bad eyes or evil and, eyes. Or like but either they believe it does it by Allah's permission, Allah made it a cause, but he didn't make it a cause. So that would be shirk asghar. But that's not kufr. No, it's not kufr. It'll only be kufr if what? He says this thing can repel the evil eye, istiqlalan. Whether Allah likes it or not. And that's the same thing that for people like, some people write Quran on knives or some people write it on papers and they hang it around. La Quran shi akhar. The Quran is something else and we're going to come to that. That's also a It's a tamima. Yeah. But the Quran will not be shirk. Even and why wouldn't it be shirk? It uses tamima. Huh? Although it uses tamima but it wouldn't be shirk. Now, my question is because I, I know a lot of people, especially in the Arab countries, okay. they do, they hang like uh, pictures of the Quran. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, it's common. People, people put it in the car, they, people put it on their neck. Like they hang, yeah. Yeah. Over their necks. This is, this is uh, what I understood from the Shaykh. They said uh, this includes the hadith, this is included in the hadith hey. that the Rasul said in the Ruqa Shaykh. My question is, what kind of Shaykh is that? Tayyib, the Quran. The charms from the Quran, the amulets from the Quran, according to the early Muslims, it's not shirk. The early Muslims, and we're talking about the Sahaba, and those who came after them immediately, the early generations of Islam, they differed about the permissibility of what? Using the Quran as a tamima. They differed about that. Some of them allowed it mutlaqa. They said you can do it. Some of them, they allowed it either nazal al-bala. Once a person is afflicted, then he can what? Use the Qur'an. But he couldn't use it before. 
and some of them prohibited absolutely. So the, the companions of Muhammad they had three opinions. But one opinion they never had was that the tama'in from the Qur'an are shirk. They never had this opinion. And it's not proper for the companions to have three opinions in an issue, or two opinions in an issue. And then someone after them come and what? And hold a third opinion, or a fourth opinion. Because in effect, what are the companions saying? The people who know the deen the best. When they hold three opinions or two opinions, what are they saying? They're basically saying, Al-Haqq la yakhruj an hadith thalatha, or hadhain al You follow me? They're saying, look, the truth is either one of these three or one of these two. So when they say that, we have to what? Say the same thing. And we try to look at the adilla, the, the evidence, to determine which one of them is what? Is closest to the what? The truth. But one thing that can be the case is that they missed the truth. And someone after them, who was less knowledgeable, less pious, and not favored by Allah to have walked with the Prophet, could what? <laughs> could reach the truth. You guys follow me? So they never said shirk, so we don't say shirk. We either say, yajuz mutlaqan, absolutely permissible. Oh, la yajuz mutlaqan, absolutely impermissible. Or, yajuz ila nazala al bala. It's permissible if what? If a person is afflicted, then he can use what? A tamim al Quran. You with me? Make sense? Tayyip, muntaz. All right, so. The qaida goes on that says, although its causative nature has not been confirmed. So anything which we don't have any proof that it's really a cause, like charms and amulets and omens and these things, then what? Then we don't confirm it. We don't confirm it. If it hasn't been confirmed by leg legitimate source of legislation, so what does that mean? It means that if it has been confirmed by what? By the Qur'an, has been confirmed by the Sunnah, then we accept it as what? We accept it as a cause. And we have examples of this. So for example, when a person is afflicted with magic, the Prophet ﷺ, he taught his companions what to do when they're afflicted by magic. So for example, to read Al-Mu'awadatayn, Qul-Hulawahat and Al-Mu'awadatayn, the last three surahs from the Qur'an, Ayat al-Kursi, he taught them this. So we know that these ayat are what? They're a cause for what? For a person to be what? Cured of magic. We also know, for example, that if a person is afraid that he'll be afflicted with the ayn, or he thinks he may have afflicted someone with the ayn, the Prophet taught us what to do to what? What can be a cause for removing it? So he said in the one hadith, he said, إِذَا رَأَ أَحَدُكُمْ مِنْ أَخِيهِ أو من نفسه أو من ماله شيئا يعجبه فليبركه. He said, if one of you sees from his brother, or from himself, or from his wealth, something which what, which impresses him, it amazes him, it pleases him, then let him do what? Let him make a tabrik, right? بارك الله عليه بارك الله عليه بارك الله عليه. And he said in the other version of the hadith, he said, Allah. Barakta in the in the He said, "Would would that you would seek baraka? You would make this tabrik, right? Because the ain, the evil eye is what is truth. And this is this is critical because most people, when they're afraid that they might strike someone with the ain, what do they usually say? They recite the one ayah from Surah Al-Kahf, right? Yeah. Right. So what is it? Um, um, so most of them will say MashaAllah or whatever, but la, it should be what a tabrik. Barakallahu alayk, barakallahu alayk, or something to this effect, right? We seek Allah's barakah, and that will repel, repel the aim. So we have these causes that came from what? From the sharia. But then the qaida goes on that says, nor by practical experience and or clinical tests. What that tells you is that. It could be confirmed by what? The Sharia. It could be confirmed by the Sharia, but it could also be confirmed by what? By practical clinical tests, like what? Like the medicines that we consume. That they've been tested, people have tested them, they've done experiments on them, right? 
They've studied them, they've done research, and they discovered that what? This particular medicine can what? Can treat this disease or can cure this disease. So through this testing, we can accept this as what? As a sebab, right? As a cause. Make sense? So we shouldn't be afraid, well, taking this medicine, is it shit? No, because what? It's been clinically tested. There's been some practical experimenting done on it. So that's the body, but that's the principle, and we've kind of broke it down. And then we talked about the reasoning behind it as well, kind of all together. And so now let's look at some of the, the proofs, the proofs for the principle. So one proof for the principle is the hadith collected by Ahmed and Al-Hakim on the authority of Uqbat ibn Amr, in which he said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, مَنْ عَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً فَقَدْ أَشْرَكْ He said, whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk, or he's fallen into what? Idolatry. And what do we mean by these amulets? Like uh, the brother said, Jazallah khair, they used to take something and they would do what? Hang it around their neck. It could be the skin of a wolf. It could be um, a particular stone that they thought had these protective powers. It could be an incantation that someone wrote for them. And they would take it and do what? Hang it, believing that it would do what? It would either bring about some benefit, give them good luck, give them some strength, or it would repel some what? Some harm, some disease they feared, or the what? The evil eye. So they thought that this thing could do what? Could either procure some benefit, bring about good fortune, or repel bad fortune or misfortune. Another hadith. The hadith of Ahmed Abu Dawood al Tirmidhi ibn Majah on the authority of Mas'ud, in which he said, Atirata shirk. Atira shirk. Atirata shirk. So he said, I'm sorry, Atiratu. He said, This believing in good and bad omens is a form of shirk. Good and bad omens. For example, they would come out of their home intending to what? To go on a journey. And they wanted to see. Is it a good idea for me to go on this journey or not? So if there was maybe a flock of birds perched on a nearby rooftop, they would do something to what? To frighten the birds so they would fly away. If those birds flew to the right, they would take it as what? As a good sign. That it's going to be a good day and I should go ahead and go ahead with this journey. And if those birds flew to the left, they would say, oh, no, no, no. This, this, is not, this, is not a good, this is not a good day to, to go on this journey. That's a bad sign. So they believed in these what? These omens. Something that they see, something they experience, and that tells them what? What they should do, whether the decree for that day is good or bad. Whether they're going to experience good fortune or misfortune. So they made these omens a what? A cause for what? For what? Good fortune or bad fortune. Or a sign of good fortune or bad fortune. I have another hadith, Al-Bukhari Muslim from the, on the authority of Ibn Umar, in which the Prophet وسلم, he said, Another La Yukadimu Shayan Wala Yuakhiru wa in the Mayustakra Jubihi Milbahir. So he said, Oaths do not hasten a desired outcome, nor do they delay, delay or thwart an outcome which is feared. They merely are used to extract from the miser what he would normally withhold. So what does that mean? That means you have a person and he wants some good fortune to come to him. Or he wants to repel some misfortune. So he makes an oath. He says, oh Allah, if you get me out of this jam. Or he says, oh Allah, if you cure my ailment or the ailment of my son. Then I will what? Then I will fast 60 days consecutively. I will make hedge. I will slaughter this many camels and feed them to the poor. So he makes this what? This promise to Allah, this oath, that he'll do some great deed if Allah does what? If Allah gives him this or gives him what? Gives him that. And they thought that this what? This kind of forces Allah's hand. And it makes him what? do the things that we want them to do in exchange for what? The good deeds we promise to do. So they thought it was a cause to get what? To get their needs. And the Prophet is saying what? It's not a cause. It's just something that the person who's stingy, right? Something he normally wouldn't do, it's something that what? 
he uses to what? To make himself do it. Because under some normal circumstances, he wouldn't do it. Right? So the prophet says, it's not really a cause for any of that, but it's just something that what? The stingy person needs to make him what? To make him give. And finally, one last hadith. We have the hadith of Abu Khal Muslim on the authority of Abu Bashir al Ansari, in which he said, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam sallam arsal rasulan an la yubqiyanna fi raqabati ba'irin qiladah aw qiladatin min watar min watarin illa qutiat. So he said that the Prophet sallallahu sent a messenger to proclaim. Let there not be a garland or ne- let not a garland remain on the neck of a camel or a garland from silk except that it is cut. So what are these garlands? Basically, when the Arabs would go for hedge and they would bring their what? Their animals for slaughtering as part of what? As part of the ritual. They were afraid that the animal might be afflicted with what? An ayn. Or it might be afflicted with some disease and they wouldn't be, they, it wouldn't make it all the way. So they wanted to protect it from what? From these things. So they would put this qilada, which is like a, like a ring, a fancy ring that they would weave. And many times they would weave, from, weave it from silk. They would make some kind of very nice fancy and they would put it on them saying, okay, I put this on the camel and we'll do what? This will protect them. This qilada will protect the camel from what? From an ain, from disease, from whatever. So they believe that what? That this thing that they put on the camel would do what? Would protect it from what? Some misfortune. But what do all of these ahadith, what do they all have in common? What do they all have in common? So the first one we said was the hadith, whoever hangs an amulet. Second one, omens. Third one, oaths. And the last one, al qalaid these garlands that they would hang around the necks of camels. What do they all have in common? Hmm? <coughs> Bringing anything as a cause. And to, as, as, as for a cause. Do you mean? It's true. So basically what they all have in common is that something is being taken as a cause, which what? There's no legitimate genuine basis for it being taken as a cause to either bring about good fortune or remove misfortune. That's what they all have in common and that's why the scholars derive from that what? This principle that we're talking about. That anytime we take something as a cause and it's not legitimized by the Sharia, then that will be what? A type of shirk. Could be shirk akbar, could be major shirk, could be what? Minor shirk and that will depend on what? The person's belief. If they believe that this thing can protect them in spite of Allah, independent of Allah, then what? That will be major shirk. If they believe it protects them by Allah's permission, by Allah's will, it will be what? Minor shirk. Well then, Tayyip. All right, so then now, these are hadith. Another thing they have in common is they all do what? They negate these things being what? Causes. They negate them. These are not causes. All these hadith tell us that these things are not what? Causes. And finally, not only do they tell, not, do they tell us that they're not causes, they tell us that they're all not permissible. They're not permitted. And in some cases, they can reach the level of what? Shirk and even shirk akbar. So one last thing we want to mention about, well, two last things. One is that causes can fall into two categories. If we look at everything we've said thus far, we have legitimate causes. Legitimate causes, which means what? They have been what? Legislated as such. Like we talked about a tabriq being a, a cause, rupiah, rupiah sharia, the legal legislated rupiah being what? A cause. Another cause, natural cause, would be what? Fire being a cause for what? For burning, right? Creating heat, right? This is something that what we've learned through what? Through practical experiments, we've seen that what? Fire burns and it gives off what? Heat. So these are what? Causes. Things that are established. Yeah. Um, you, say, you said something about Rukia and other things. Hey. Are those like causes, but we have to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. All the rules that regulate. And one of them is that we have to, we, we can't believe, believe the causes. Is the hey, the one who ultimately. 
is going to cure. طيب. Um, then the second type of cause is fallacious, illegitimate. It's baseless, it's unfounded. And those are the ones that what? They haven't been confirmed by what? The Sharia. And they haven't been confirmed by what? By clinical tests. But they're more something based upon what? Superstition or tradition. And we have no what? Legitimate basis for them. Also, it's important to bear in mind when we think about this concept of causes, is there always has to be what? There always has to be a link between the cause and the effect. There has to be a link between the cause and the effect. Because the only one who can bring about an effect without there being any link between him and the object is who? Allah. Allah says what? Be, and it is. And there's no what? There's no connection between him and what? And the object. Everything else, there must be some type of what? Connection. There has to be some type of connection. If there's no connection, then what? If there's no connection, that's a sign to us that what? It's not what? A real cause? And maybe if we see this happening, it's from the tala'ub, it's from the tricks that who? That the shayateen, that the devils play on mankind. So, whenever we look at any type of cause and effect relationship between two things, we need to look for what? The link. Sometimes the link is what? Mubashir. The iktisal is mubashir. So, for example, I come to this door, and I want to open the door. So I extend my hand, and I do what? I push it. So now, the cause and the effect, there's what? There's a link. And that link is clear to everyone. My hand touched the door, and from the strength of me pushing it, it what? It opened. And this is, this is a cause-effect relationship, which is clear to anyone. Everybody can look at that and see that. Okay? You also have some cause-effect relationships which are not clear to everyone, but they're known to what? The people who they specialize. Give an example. You go home, and you want to see what's on the news. Okay? And you pick up this little device, this rectangular device, and you point it at what? Your television. You push the button, and it does what? Comes on. Is there a connection? Yes. There's a connection, but do you see it? You don't see it, but you know it's there, especially the people who what? Who know about this what? This, this, this jihaz, this device, and how it what? How it interacts with the other device. But there is a what? There is a connection, right? Some people know about it, some people don't know about it, but there is a connection, and the people who know, know about it. All right, now let me give you another example. Somebody comes to the door, and they say some incantation, open sesame, and it opens. Okay? All right, so now, is there any connection? There's no connection. Okay? So can we believe that open sesame is a cause? No, that's the games that the devils play to make people what? Buy in. To make people buy in. To make people believe that what? That this is a cause because I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes. No, what you saw was what? was the game that the devils play. So this person said, open says to me and went to the gym, went and did what? Push the door open. You follow me? Okay, so that's another thing we have to pay attention to, too. Anytime there's a cause, an effect, there has to be what? A link. Yeah, there has to be a link. Like, last thing we're gonna do is what? Talk about some rules that govern the causes. That will help us what? To avoid falling into shit when it comes to what? The concept of what? Cause and effect relationships. And that's going to bring everything together for the chapters we're going to discuss in the coming weeks. So the first thing, the first rule, is that nothing should be considered a cause for anything except by what? By legislation. Either we have it in the Quran or the Hadith, or we have practical what? Practical evidence, experimentation to back it up. That's the first rule. And we kind of discuss that in detail. That's the first rule. So when I'm dealing with a cause and effect, I want to say, this will bring about this result. I need to what? Either I need to have deliver from the Qur'an, or I need to have practical what? Practical proof to support it. So I shouldn't say, hey, if you take the skin of a wolf, and you hang it on your door, 
it'll repel the jinn. And somebody asked me, where did you get that from? And I don't have the Quran, and I don't have some clinical test to back it up, that's a problem. And that goes for anything. Don't say something is a cause for something. This will protect you from this. This will give you good fortune if you don't want. If you can't back it up. Either with what? The Quran, Sunnah, Dalil, or with what? Clinical proof, practical tests, experiments, etc. The second thing is that when the believer uses any cause, it's a legitimate cause, and he wants to use it, he shouldn't rely on the what? On the cause. But he relies on who? Allah. So he puts his trust in Allah, not in the in the cause. He puts his trust in Allah. And this is um, this is a big problem, for example, in some countries where um, you have like the issue of wasaba. Right? You have people you need connections, you need to know people to get things done. But what happens is that people buy in so much to the concept of wasaba that they forget about who? Allah. And they think, well, if I have this wasaba, I can make it happen. They actually believe that the wasata, they put their trust in the wasata, not in who? Allah. It gets that bad. So that's the thing too, that um, something can be a cause, it can be a legitimate cause, okay? But even if it's a legitimate cause, we can't put our trust in the cause, we have to put our trust in who? In Allah. But the next thing is that the cause, no matter how great it is in nature, in size, effectiveness, etc., it doesn't matter. It doesn't bring about the result independently. It doesn't make the thing happen independently. It makes the things happen by what? By Allah's will. Which means that the cause is what? It's subservient to Allah's will and also subservient to what? The conditions being right for what? For it to bring about the effect. So the cause is not what? It's not something which what? No matter how strong it is, no matter how big it is, no matter how effective it normally is in normal circumstances, it's still what? Governed by Allah's will, subservient to Allah's will, susceptible to Allah's will. So if Allah doesn't will, it won't, it won't have the effect that it normally would have, which goes back to what we said before. That's why we need to have trust in who? Allah. Perfect example, fire usually does what? Burns. That's what fire does. But can it burn if Allah doesn't will? No. What's the proof? Ibrahim. Ibrahim. It can't burn if Allah doesn't will, even though it's fire. And that's what it's made to do. And that's the cause and effect that Allah created and gave it, gave it that ability to what? To burn. Also, it can't burn if the conditions are not right. So I have some wood that's soaking wet, wet to the core. Is it going to burn? No. It's not going to burn because the conditions are not right. So the causes are what? Are in fact weak. And they're what? Dependent on what? They're, they're susceptible to Allah's will and to the conditions being what? Being right and suitable. But number four, no cause is totally capable of bringing about the result except by Allah's will, which is more like an emphasis of number three. But number five, if you have a religious cause, something which is actually an act of worship, then it can only be employed if it's supported by what? By delil. Because if we have a religious cause and we have no delil, not only could it be shirk, it could be what? It would be bid'ah. If we have no delil for this religious cause. So a person says, for example, um, if you pray two rak'ah after, after you eat, then you'll never have I don't know, stomach illness, I don't know. They just say something like this. So they make this, so now this is a religious act. And so now when that person makes rak'ati and he makes two rak'ah, he won't be committing shit, but he'll be committing what? Bid'ah, right? Because he has no delil for this what? For this cause. طيب, ثم بعد ذلك, the last, or number six, is we're going to reiterate that no one and no thing can bring about the desired results without a direct one connection, a direct link between that cause and what? The effect or the object, except Allah. Allah is the only one who can say what? Kun, fayakun, be and it is. Everything else has to what? have a link. Uh, the fifth point, I think, the one we had just before this one, uh -huh. uh, you, said, you said you were talking about the bid'ah. So some people say that um, if you if you eat Surah Al-Baqarah this much times and 
lose much fingers and stuff mm. like that, you'll get like people that don't get pregnant will get pregnant and stuff like that. Is mm. it a bid'ah or not? Yeah, it's gonna be a bid'ah because unless they have basis for it, unless they have some deal for it. Anytime we say that if you do this, you'll get this result, and it's an act of worship, and you do it with that intention. I'm going to do this because what? It will, it will bring about this result. I'll give it a clear example. Hey. Some Mashiach say, like, if you want to get married or stuff like that, you, you, uh, you read, like, you pray, and you, saw, you, you say so many times a specific guy in the street, mm -hmm. and, like, you read Surah Al-Baqarah 40 times, hey. and they have those, a lot of those Mashiach have those uh, things. Is that bid'ah or not bid'ah? And they say that they have tried it, and other people have tried it, good people have tried it, yeah. and it worked. But it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, like, it could have worked not because you did this. So? Like, so? Is that bid'ah? Can you call that bid'ah, or just you leave it like that? Okay, let, let, me, let, let, me, let me tell you this. And bid'ah, you're going to know it from a few different angles. One of the angles, which is related to what you said, is when you take an act of worship and you look at the the setup the cause for you doing that act of worship if you have an innovative cause for doing that act of worship then that act of worship becomes what bit even though the act of worship is legislative i'll give an example person um his father died on a wednesday his father died on a wednesday so he fasts every Wednesday. And so you ask him, why do you fast on Wednesdays? He says, because my father died on Wednesday. So I fast on Wednesday. So now fasting on Wednesday by itself is not what? Bid'ah. But this guy, his fasting on Wednesday is what? Bid'ah. Why? Because he created what? A cause for it. A reasoning behind it, which is not what? Legislated. So now apply that rule to anything. Person says, okay, I recite Surah Al-Baqarah completely, every day. We say what? That's awesome. That's awesome. May Allah make me like you. He says, I recite Surah Al-Baqarah completely every day because whoever recites Surah Al-Baqarah completely every day will what? Will get married. So we say, now that's a problem. It becomes a bid'ah. And he made this act of worship for which he would get lots of reward. He made it what? Something that he won't get any reward. Because of what? He created a cause or a justification for it that wasn't what? That wasn't legislated. So yeah, you can apply that to anything. If we don't have the deal that this is a cause for that and you make it a cause and it's a religious act, it won't be shirk. It will be what? Bid'ah. For example, my question, I was, the other day I was listening to Sheikh, his name is Sadiq al He's mm -hmm. known in Medina. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. He's, he's one of the top of the hey. And he was talking about reading Surah Al-Baqarah so many times and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. For pregnancy, and th you know, and fertility, and um, hey. getting married and stuff. So, you know, I said, this is bid'ah, but then I said, you know, this is a big shaykh, so I should, so I should make sure and ask you. Hey. Is that bid'ah? Hey. Is that like cold, clear bit of I mean, if he do? if he doesn't have if he has a deal for it if he no, provides a proof for it. The only he has is people have tried hey. it. It works. I've tried it. It works. That's no. Well, he didn't talk about Salat al Baqarah. He talked about Rabbi la tadarni farda wa anta khairul warifin. Ah, that's a different one. Yeah, he said if you do it 40, day, 40 times in hey. sujood, okay, you will have baby. Uh, that's but, another one. That yeah, but he <laughs> supported by he used 40 days. It's like the number is 40 from different stories. It's like Musa and eh. other things. So he's supported by that. That's another one. Well, that. what I would say is this, Ya Khwani, is that I'll say two things. One is that we have to be very careful to go to, for example, Israeliyat and the stories of the previous religious communities and use it as a basis for anything. Because the scholars have differed about whether or not shara'u man kana qablana shara'u lana. They differ about whether or not the the law, the legislation of the people before us is what? Is a shara' lana. And the strongest opinion is that yes, it is if what? If the vehicle for its transmission is the Qur'an or the Hadith. Meaning that if the vehicle for its transmission, the way it reached us is from what? From an Israeliyat, it won't be shara'. It won't be shara' lana. Why? Because we don't know if it's what? 
factual or not anyway. So that's the first thing. So never let that be a delil. If somebody says, okay, this is the case and my delil, and he quotes an Isra'iliyat, then we're not, we're not going to accept that. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we have to be aware, we have to be, we have to be aware of, well, this has to be right because this sheikh said it. I don't want to say it's wrong because this sheikh said it. We have to be aware. We have to be aware of that. Sure I'm just saying, I just want to, I want to say because I, I hear that a lot. Well, people will say, they'll say, well, what do you think about this? And you say, well, to be honest with you, that's not right. And they'll say, but sheikh so-and-so said, that's, how, this, this is, that's, that's wrong, ya khwan. Ibn Taymiyyah, he mentioned, he said, Kalam ulama, yuhtajju lahu, wa la yuhtajju bihi. He said, the statements of the scholars, we seek evidence to support it. And we don't what? Use it as evidence. No one should ever say, this is the haq. You say, why? He says, because Ibn Taymiyyah said it. Because Al Albani said, Ibn Taymiyyah said, hadha khata. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. It's not going to be right because Al Albani said it. It's going to be right because what? Because Al Albani had the what? The delil. It's going to be right because of Al Albani's delil or Ibn Taymiyyah's delil. So I, you have some mashayikh. They are big mashayikh. We don't question that. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be right about everything. They're not. Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every son of Adam. That includes what? The mashayikh al kibar. All of them what? Make mistakes. They err. And so that being the case, our ra'id, our leader, has to always be what? The delil. We always have to look to what? The delil. And even Allah says that. He says, فَإِن تَنَزَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِ If you differ in anything, take it back to Allah and His Messenger. He didn't say, take it back to what? Al-Mashayikh Al-Kibar. Right? He didn't say, go back to what? The big scholars. He said, go back to what? The delil. Right? Because even the big scholar can be what? Can be mistaken. So it's wrong for us to, to, um, to shy away from the truth because of, or to, t to try to make other people shy away from the truth because of what? Because of who said. To the point that some of the great scholars of the contemporary age, like for example, the Sa'adi and the Shanqiti, they would say things like this. Whenever we study a mas'ala, we never look at who said. We just look at what? The delil. Because we might be swayed by who said. We only look at who said after what? After we study what? The delil. And then once we study the delil and the delil is pointing us in one direction, we're never swayed by who said. Once we know the delil and that this is what it should be, then we look at who said. Because we want to know who said. We want to know where the ulama are. But we don't want where they are to sway us to follow what we know is not right according to what? According to the delil. Anyway. Is that also bidah? What? Like going to the Quran and saying that this was mentioned like 45 times in the Quran. Remember the Qaeda. This is the, yeah. This I'm is giving you a Qaeda. I'm giving you a principle clear. which is Muttarida, you say. It's Muttarida. I'm giving you something you can use it under every circumstance. I'm, instead of giving you a fish, this is bidah. Then you got to come to me tomorrow. Well, what about this? Is this bidah? No, I'm giving you what? You a fishing see. pole. Yeah, I'm giving the pole. So you just use this Qaeda and it's going to what? You, you'll know. You'll be able to recognize bidah, not bidah. Yeah. So if, again, if you have a sabab, you say, this is the reason why we do this ibadah. And you don't have a delil to support that sabab, it's one. Bidah. Yeah. The, the last thing um, we're going to mention about causes, then we'll close, is sometimes what happens in Khwani is that you have a cause, and that cause is a worldly cause. It's not something that Allah necessarily... Uh, let's say the Quran or Sunnah, but it's a worldly cause. Some of the people ex make experiments and they come to conclude that, hey, this, this cause is, yeah, is effective. We've done practical clinical tests and we've seen that this is effective. Even though that might be the case, not every cause which proves to be effective through clinical tests is permissible for a believer to, uh, to employ it. So there might be some causes which they're, they're effective, but the, the dean tells us what? We can't employ them. You can't use this. Right? Like what? What's a, what's a, uh, a, a, a cure-all, or some people were saying it's a cure for cancer now, and it's becoming legalized in some states. Marijuana. Marijuana, yeah. And people are saying it, it, can, it can cure this, and it can cure that, and people have been cured from chronic 
knee pain and people been cured from this and certain types of cancer have have regressed you know when people of whatever but it wouldn't be permissible for a believer to use that even though what may have proved effective through clinical tests because what because the deen prohibits it and this is from Mas'ud he said in Allah لم يجعل شفاكم في شيء حرم عليكم أو حرمه عليكم he said that Allah has not made your cure in anything which he what he prohibited anything he prohibited know that what that's not where your cure is your cure is elsewhere واضح so that's what I have to say about cause any questions يا شباب any questions يا أخوات any questions we'll stop there and then we'll hit the we'll start the chapter hit the ground running and start the actual chapter next week any questions going once going twice go on sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mubarak sallallahu alayhi wa sallam